Okay, we are connecting, connecting. And with that, we are officially live for this week's Black Freedom Lectures. My dog is barking in the background. That's how you know. That's how live it really is. It is really wonderful to see all of you. Um, I am Eve Ewing. I'm the curator of the Black Freedom Lectures, and I am coming to you live from the city currently known as Chicago, which is the occupied lands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa nations, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. What is new with us this week? Well, first of all, um, I just came from an in-person graduation, as I told our guests, so I am uh, like a melted popsicle, but also very overly energized and ready to project that energy onto our exciting guests this evening. Um, tomorrow, we have a new lecture dropping from Dr. Moya Bailey on Black Disability Studies. Extremely excited about that. You can catch it right here on our YouTube channel at 6 p.m. Central. And next Thursday, one week from today, June 17th, also at 6 p.m. Central, Dr. Bailey will be joining us for a live Q&A. So you can ask all of your questions about Blackness and disability. In case you don't know, Moya Bailey is also the person who originated the term misogynoir and has a new book coming out about the concept of misogynoir. So I bet if you're really Really nice. Um, Moya might also answer some of those type of questions. Um, Moya Bailey is the GOAT. So as always, if you can't remember any of the times or dates that I just said, it's not a problem if you sign up for our newsletter at blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. That is blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. And now for this evening's conversation. First, I want to say thank you as always to our team of co-conspirators, um, Imani Legron and Sianda Mohutsiwa, who will be playing a special role this evening, as well as our ASL interpreter, Barbara Williams Finley, and our friends and colleagues at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and the Mellon Foundation. I'm going to start by introducing this week's discussant. Um, she's kind of a legend because you hear me say her name every week, but now here she is in the flesh. Sianda Mohutsiwa, who is also known as the person who edits our videos and makes them look very nice. She is a doctoral student in the sociology department at the University of Chicago, where she researches all kinds of things from computational methods to machine learning, AI, social media, post-colonial theory, African history, and so much more. She's also a very accomplished fiction writer and an essayist and a very good speaker all around dope person. And we are extremely grateful not only to have her on our team every week, but to have her in conversation this evening with our special guest. And speaking of that very special guest tonight, I am excited to introduce someone like is the case with many of our guests, somebody who I look up to a whole lot. Um, and that is Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin is a professor of African American studies at Princeton University. She's also the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab and the author of the award-winning book, Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. Her work investigates the social dimensions of science, medicine, and technology with a focus on the relationship between innovation and inequity, health and justice, knowledge and power. You can check her out at ruhabenjamin.com. That's R-U-H-A Benjamin.com. If you want to live tweet all the dope things that she's going to say tonight, her Twitter is Ruha9. It's also her Instagram, so you can see more pictures of her very cool triangular room. Welcome to both of you, and I am looking forward to your conversation. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. E. It's been a pleasure working with you, and I'm really excited to talk to Dr. Benjamin today. Um, my first question um, is... How did you come to this space? Because it feels so specific, but also so prescient as if when you began, you knew it was the right time for this because we're now at an epoch where technology has such a significant effect on our lives that it really, really, really matters who designs it. So how did you find yourself in the right place in the right time in the right moment in history? Well, thank you, Sianda, for taking time out. I know it's a busy time of the semester, and Eve's introduction of you reminded me that I want to hear your talk on these issues as well. So we might have to add a, a coda to this series because I, I'm just so thrilled to know that you're working on the things that you are in sociology and that you're combining it with creative writing, with public speaking, and so on. So just Thank you so much for being in conversation tonight. So like with any question of origin, there's like the long, medium and short version. So I'm gonna to try to give you as short a version of how I came to it as possible. I would say first the question of how I came to um, 
looking at the social dimensions of science, technology, and medicine started when I was an undergrad at Spelman College. And at that time, I was focused more or less on medicine and healthcare, thinking about the conventional approaches to childbearing and childbirth and how it affected Black women in particular, and studying that, that process in the institutional context alongside community-based approaches to child to childbearing, specifically the long tradition of Black midwives that at the time in Atlanta when I lived there was a, re a really um, a rich tradition. And in fact, I used a, a, a well-known midwife, Saran Henderson, to um, give birth to my son when I uh, finished uh, undergrad. And so that was where I started looking critically at medicine and healthcare. And I took some of those questions about power and inequality to the context of biotechnologies as a graduate student. At that time, I was in California and there was a lot of investment in regenerative medicine and stem cell research. And so I kind of placed that sociological, that power analysis on, on this, um, you know, this field of stem cell science and regenerative medicine more broadly. And that was my first book people science. And um, my second book wasn't supposed to be race after technology. I didn't have that in mind as what the next step was. But I, then I started to notice um, a lot of the mainstream coverage of what people call machine learning, machine bias, algorithmic discrimination. I was looking at the way it was framed in, in the mainstream media and the public discourse around it. And I was um, really energized to contribute what I had been learning about this intersection of power and science and sociality to this, this specific um, context, specific set of issues. And when I started, it was not, we weren't yet in the, in the time that we are now, what some people call the tech lash, the backlash against big tech, it was before that. So when I started working on it, I was um, kind of wary. I, I thought, you know, as my critique would get out there, I would have more pushback, more resistance, people saying, oh, you can't, this is neutral, this, you can, this doesn't have any racism you know, associated with it. We were still in that very naive stage of thinking about what now almost seems common sense. Like, of course, these tools are created by humans, the social context, the implicit bias, well, how, what all the different terms that we have to name the fact that human beings bring our S-H-I-T to the table when we're designing things. Um, that is now sort of in the last few years, that understanding has grown, not just among scholars, not just among practitioners, but in, I find just in terms of general public understanding, which is good because now I feel the conversation often g starts with me. People are like, okay, we get it, we get it, we get it. Now, what do we do about it? <laughs> and so I don't have to make as much of a case. But um, this, so this, the, to wrap up, the, it's the idea really that um, seeing the development of, you know, the power of computation of, of what we I would put in quote AI, because a lot of what comes under the umbrella of AI, there's a lot of branding and marketing associated with it that covers up the fact that in some cases it's kind of just regular old, regular regular statistics, <laughs> we might say. Um, and so, uh, AI in quotes, the, the fact that I think I was motivated primarily by witnessing how much impact it was having on people's lives, making all kinds of decisions about people's opportunities in when it came to education, healthcare, credit, policing, the list goes on. And I thought we needed more uh, of a critical uh, approach to these technologies than I, as I saw happening at the time that I started. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's an, that's, that's an amazing wrap up. I'm like, <laughs> flawed. Um, what I do want to ask about, and something I found very interesting in your talk was the social context of technologies, how they're advertised and how they are spoken about in the cultural setting in which they are made. And in the, in your lecture, um, you talk about, which is available on this channel for anyone watching, but um, in your lecture, you talk about an ad for robots that uses the term slaves and it says we're going to have slaves again and now I'm like again to who who's we <laughs> right um but the thing I always think about is like when people talk about technological dystopias especially in the west what I tend to see is a fear of a repetition 
of coloniality, right? Mm -hmm. So if this is if this is a technology that is coming from a settler colonialist mindset, of course, yeah. the best it can imagine is a settler colonial technology, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I often ask people, like, what do you think a technology, what would Silicon Valley be like if it was run by Buddhist monks or mm -hmm. if it was run mm -hmm. by the Basaro and the Khalakhadi Desert in mm -hmm. Southern Africa? How would it be if it wasn't a totally different thing? And so my question yeah. really is, um, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about some of the ways the social context mm -hmm. um, but specifically, I want you to talk about if that's possible, the economic context of mm -hmm. how these things are communicated to us. Because you mentioned that Amazon um, does this cool thing where this guy suddenly is going to the moon. Meanwhile, workers don't have um, yeah. pay, fair pay and so on. Yeah. So I want to hear a lot about, about this economic thing, because another I'm just yeah. going to wrap a lot of your points into this question. <laughs> and then yeah. another point you have <laughs> is about the control of the technology, the capital control. Mm -hmm. So when this mm -hmm. whole thing started, we were all really pumped. As you said, we had a lot of optimism. And I think what happened is, or what a lot of people are saying happened is once they started um, moving towards advertising as a model, that completely mm -hmm. changed how the internet is. So I'm, I grew up in internet 2.0 where we don't make blogs, where we don't make, mm -hmm. where we don't write code, where we don't do any of that cool stuff. So mm -hmm. I just wanna hear how you see capitalism or economic systems shaping mm -hmm. the narratives, the imagination mm -hmm. and the contours of this tech. Um, then mm -hmm. one last thing, I swear to God. And you said another thing that you said, we'll, we wish we'll come back to, but you said mm -hmm. about how sometimes um, the, the dream of some person is the under, mm -hmm. has, has the underside of our downfall. So I mm. think that might be part of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you now, I don't have a great memory. So I'm going to answer the first thing and then I'm going to ask you to remind me what the second, third, fourth one is. Okay. So the uh, you know, sociology 101, context matters. <laughs> My dissertation advisor, Troy Duster, his mantra, he would be like, location, location, location. He was like, it's true of real estate, it's true of society, <laughs> right? And so there's no, there's no accurate analysis of a technology without situating it in its context. And so, for example, the robot slaves, the context is both what existed prior to the technology and then what emerges with the introduction of the technology. And so this is what my shorthand for that is the inputs and the outputs, right? We have to think about, and I think too often with the analysis of technology, we are trained, uh, we are more focused on the outputs. And that's what I named as, you know, we're talking about the techno determinism. We look at what, how the technology affects us. So for example, for those who might've seen the, the recent uh, film, A Social Dilemma on Netflix, that's all about how technology makes us addictive. That's really starting as the technology is a given and then it creates these effects in the world. And so that's about context, but it gives so much um, agency to the technology itself without thinking about what existed prior, just not just in terms of individuals and what they input, but the social context. And so if you change the context, the, the technology is gonna change and the, the outputs are gonna change. It doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna change for the better. And so it's, it's you know, part of it is that we might have a, a, a romantic idea just changing and making the tech workforce more diverse. Um, that a lot of people, when they hear the issues that I'm raising in, in the talk and race after technology, the first go-to question often, you know, is, so does this mean we need to diversify the tech workforce? And my answer to that is uh, yes, and that itself is not going to fundamentally transform what the economic context. And that's, aha, see, remember, I remember, oh, I can't remember the economic context. And so that's where I have the example of Jason Mars in the talk where you have this black computer scientist starting his own app and he, he recognizes that most of our digital assistants have this white feminized voice. And he said he wants to kind of play around with that. He wants to change the status quo. Maybe it should sound like him. And ultimately, he says he doesn't do that because he doesn't want to create friction. First, my products need to sell. So even if you have someone who's black behind the screen with the intention 
to change up the, the status quo, they're still responding to a context that is gonna push back against that. And so they, he ends up deferring to, to the norm, to, the, to the, the racial gendered norm there. So that is instructive for us that we can't simply change the, de dem uh, you know, the demographics of who's do doing the designing without also fundamentally changing the, the political economic context in which in our case, the economic profit and the value trumps other values, trumps other social and public values. And so, yeah, perhaps if you created, had all Buddhist monks behind the screen or you had all San indigenous people behind the screen, we might get different technologies, but if it's still, it's still occurring in a context of racial capitalism and, they, and that has to you know, still dictates what they do, we might, it might not be as transformative as we hope. And so the question becomes for all of us is, can we begin to imagine an, a different ecosystem, a different set of, of economic and political um, values that animate uh, the design of our, our physical and digital infrastructures? And there are people and initiatives experimenting with that, you know, and so it's not, it's, it's the, similar to prison abolition. We're not gonna go from our current context to no prisons overnight, but gradually we're working and we're, we're, we're practicing different forms of sociality, different forms of creating transformative justice and, and community-based um, you know, accountability. And so similarly, when it comes to this, we have to think about what alternatives can we begin to seed now, foster now that, that we can grow over time one example that folks can go take look up, you know, if we describe the current tech ecosystem as one where the business model is platform capitalism in which our data, our data has value and it's and, you know, the more of it, whoever monopolizes that really dictates the terms. So what would be an alternative to platform capitalism? And there are a number of initiatives that are being, um, people are working on under the umbrella of platform cooperativism. So thinking about a cooperative economic model um, where the people who create it, the workers actually are a share in the value of it. And so for those interested, take a look at what's happening under the rubric of platform cooperativism and, and a number of other, you know, a number of other initiatives I'm thinking, a last one I'll mention, is my Spelman sister, uh, Falon Wil Wilson, is um, working on this idea of black tech futures, you know, a different ecosystem um, in which that it has both the economic uh, critique, but also a racial justice, of, uh, you know, um, value that's being built into how we imagine um, the design of technologies. And so I touched at least on two of the questions. Now you tell me if I what I missed. <laughs> you answered them all and went above and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, something I really enjoy about your work is that I feel like you are a very solution-based scientist in the sense that um, sometimes I think I can come away from a paper or a talk or a book feeling like, okay, this is a huge problem and it is so large and it feels so deeply ingrained and it feels so like, long tentacles touching everything that it feels like it's impossible to overcome. But what I find really valuable about your work is the repeated emphasis on the people who have gone against the grain. And a couple things that I thought were really interesting was um, how you approach that. So one of them is like, in your talk, you talked about um, the people who say, oh, this was the context of the time. Like people, everybody was racist. And um, and while everyone was pro slavery back then, I'm like, but what about the slaves? <laughs> like they were not. Yeah, they don't the, count. <laughs> they, hello. Um, but I really think that one thing that I found interesting, because this also goes into another thing you talk about, is you mentioned a French scientist, mm -hmm. quote unquote scientist, who talks mm -hmm. about um the racial features or quote unquote what became racial features, but like the features of black or racialized mm -hmm. peoples and white peoples and how that signifies different acumen or whatever ridiculous thing. And one of his students, you said, refuted it using science and he came against him and he was like, he didn't just talk about it from a moral perspective, which I think mm -hmm. is enough anyway, yeah. but he spoke about it from like, okay, let's walk through your logic and show you that it's 
count it's counterproductive and it makes me think of Du Bois and his research and looking at statistics and formulating all this really great information but Mm -hmm. you mentioned how sometimes it's Mm -hmm. not enough Mm -hmm. and there was this experiment um I don't know if people have seen this in the lecture hopefully but where people were given stats on black um like black imprisonment rates Mm -hmm. and they were like yeah let's get more cops (laughs) and it was like not what the researchers expected so I want to hear more on that like where do you think this comes from like why does information and science and statistics sometimes backfire in the fight against racism yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I think the the point boils down to um, the, the idea that the facts alone won't save us and that we have to be at, we have to care as much and be as rigorous around the stories that we tell about the social world as we are the statistics. And even if you look at Du Bois's own career, you know, he started out as a hardcore, like, I'm going to get the data, I'm going to get the science. And then he was like, I'm gonna tell y'all some stories. Like we gonna get into science fiction and, you know, and so even if you look at the trajectory, we know Du Bois the scientist, we know the Du Bois the advocate, but the lesser known Du Bois is Du Bois the artist because increasingly pouring into and thinking about how can we begin to think anew about this, this world that we're building and really taking fiction seriously as a site of, of world building, right? And so we see in his life. And so similarly, I think it's instructive with that, um, the Stanford study that I mentioned is that I just think we underestimate how, how much we are storytelling beings, <laughs> you know, rather than like people who sit and like, you know, rational actor theory, like sitting, what are the pros and cons? Let me add this up. Okay, this makes more sense. Like we, we assume humanity is like an automata, <laughs> like a robot, <laughs> rather than realizing how much stories and stories not as a straightforward good, like that study is about racist stories that people tell themselves in order to justify the carceral status quo. And so stories is not like romantic, like, oh yes, just more stories. No, we need to be careful about what stories circulate and how they're often used to justify keeping things the same. And so, you know, that uh, it goes back to your first point about, you know, thinking about solutions. I think that grows out of my, my pedagogy and just, you know, working with students and realizing like, you know, you can lay out all the data about how bad things are. You can look at white supremacy in every corner of our world from housing to healthcare, et cetera. But as a teacher, I feel it's my responsibility also as part of that to show how groups and movements have been and are working to counteract that. Like that is part of the, the, the process of black study. It's not just diagnosing. And so when you begin to actually pull in the stories of people who don't have the luxury to be pessimistic and, and, and throw their hands up, why? Because their life depends on it. <laughs> and you engage that and fold that into to Black study. I think one, it, it, it reflects you know, what Miriam Kaba is teaching us about hope as a discipline. And it also forces us to take stories, narrative, um, seriously and understand the porous boundary between what we consider facts and what are what is deemed fiction. Because in reality, um, race is a master fiction, right? And so, and yet it has such powerful effects in our everyday lives, which tells us fiction wields power. It's not something ephemeral that just happens after the fact. We have the luxury, oh, maybe we'll take this seriously. No, the fiction of race actually orders the world. <laughs> and so it's imperative then as both analysts and, and people who, who uh, are sickened by the, the racist status quo to take both the fictions that are killing us seriously and also to foster fictions that are life affirming, <laughs> that actually energize us and bring us joy. That was astounding. Thank you so much. I feel really... Um inspired by that answer I think it was I just really enjoy the idea of hope as a discipline um before 
I want to talk, I want to get some questions from the audience that have been sent, which are really cool. But before we get there, I want to ask one more question, which is something I always, always think about. Um, so it's actually two questions in one. I want you to talk a bit more. I wish I, I loved this analogy of racism as a technology or of race as a technology because it's productive, it is innovative, it is forward looking, it is backwards, you know? And I really want you to expand on that. Like when we talk about technology, we're talking, we think, we think it's about hardware or it's mm -hmm. about software. It's yeah. also about the mythology of a culture, yeah. right? Because it's doing things and making things. And then the yeah. second one, which is kind of out of left field, but it comes from my own international yeah. background and our connection to Swaziland, I guess. Yay. Um, <laughs> one of the things I always think about, especially when this COVID thing went off the rails, was um, people talking about, and you talk about this in your talk too, like medical devices that cannot detect certain things on black skin or like on African American people's features or whatever it is mm -hmm. because of like um, quote unquote race neutral work. Mm -hmm. What I always think is like, um, I feel like what we like, they, like there's an entire continent of black scientists, mm -hmm. like an entire continent of like maybe millions of black scientists. I don't know how many, I know my dad's one of them, but like mm -hmm. there is, production so that's what I really like when you brought in the Brazilian um connection mm -hmm. to of like how can we foster more international yeah. um cooperation because I think that's part of the solution of like yeah. American authors because you know about this epistemological hierarchy of like knowledge only comes from America it doesn't come into America so how mm -hmm. do we reverse that how do black um, students and Black um, academics foster serious engagement with Caribbean studies, Black mm -hmm. diaspora in general, and African yeah. scientists to counteract yeah. this hegemony. So I think those yeah. are the two questions. Yeah, absolutely. So race as a technology, I think, you know, um, here, of course, I am really inspired by Beth Coleman's initial formulation of this in, in an essay um, that, um, you know, I engage with in, in the text. Um, and I think it also grows out of my science fiction roots in terms of thinking about how race and racism create uh, parallel universes. <laughs> we could think of them as, you know, perhaps not parallel, but, you know, one on top of the other where we can be, we can be in the same space, even be in the same conversation, but depending on the way that racial his that racial history has overdetermined our experiences and our life chances, we can walk away with very different experiences, these parallel realities. And so the idea of race as a technology is not just in terms of contemporary emerging fancy, you know, automation. It's also you can look at, you know, financial technologies like redlining maps <laughs> that were used to segregate literally space um, and geography and look at the way that that tool, you know, what was employed in, in a way that was uh, seemingly objective, just filling out a form, putting in different, you know, qualities of the neighborhood and how it actually through the fine print of both red, redlining maps and restrictive covenants produced an entire world <laughs> that overdetermined life chances. And so in this little tool, you can begin to see. And so I think it's good to bring in these historic examples to remind us that what we're grappling with now in terms of AI and, and you know, emerging technologies, there's precedent there, both in terms of how we can analyze it and how we can see what the likely, likely effects are. And I think the last thing I'll say is that I, for me, it's useful because so often racism is uh, conflated with like individuals having ill feeling towards um, others and, you know, oh, a racial slur here and, you know, uh, individual slight there rather than as something, again, using the word uh, that is productive and that it, entire regimes and institutions can be invested in maintaining, even if the individuals in them feel like they're just, you know, they're just doing their job. They have no animus. So it can, it doesn't rely on animus. <laughs> it re relies on people clocking in and out and just doing their job. We can look, for example, I didn't mention in the talk, a text that shows IBM's role in the Holocaust and how, you know, one way to understand it is as a bureaucracy of evil where people just put their heads down, 
clocked in and out, use these punch cards in order to surveil and document where different, you know, what populations existed. And that created the context where you could exterminate entire groups of people, but it didn't rely on those people doing their jobs to hate any of those groups, just to be indifferent, just not to ask any questions and put their heads down and be part of this machinery of racism. And so the question for us today is, in what context are we just putting our heads down, clocking in and out, not asking any big questions, just doing our job and potentially producing uh, death machines. And certainly we see a, a striking parallel when it comes both to policing technologies and ICE immigration technologies and the role of many big tech companies in providing the hardware and software that allows for the surveillance of, of different groups that ultimately leads to their deportation, their, their imprisonment, their incarceration, et cetera. And so that context of IBM and the Holocaust, it's not far away, it's happening right now. And there are people going to work right now contributing to that. And that's why uh, briefly in the talk, I mentioned the small but hopefully growing group of tech insiders and organizers that are standing up against that and saying, tech won't build it. We all, we work here, but we won't create this, you know, understanding that it really takes um, people to, to step up to throw a wrench in that machinery. Um, in terms of the question, the international question, certainly, I definitely think that, you know, we see examples where depending on where the technology is produced, it is more or less equipped to be, be useful for the people, you know, when we're talking about, let's say, photographic technologies. Um, it's not even just that, uh, you know, black technicians and scientists, because the population that has to use these, you know, generally speaking, are darker skin, they're catering to that population. And so importing technologies that were, are not trying to optimize for dark skin into those contexts, we shouldn't be surprised, uh, you know, that that they don't work because they're not they're not being prioritized. It's again that indifference. But what's interesting, there's an example that I touch on briefly in my book of um, a Chinese manufacturer that is selling photographic digital technologies in West Africa, and it works very well on dark skin <laughs> because they're like these are the people who have to use it, and you know, so they know their market. And so I think these examples remind us that there's nothing inherent like that, oh, it's too hard to do. No, it's just not a priority for you, you know? Um, and so I definitely think that what, what you're describing as thinking internationally, globally, where are the hubs and the sites of, of this work? And that's why I think, um, you know, I, I attended a, uh, international machine learning conference in Nairobi a couple years ago. And the whole idea is that, first of all, most of these international conferences never happen in, in, on the continent, but also, and, and, the, and that leads to certain kinds of di uh, ripple effects in terms of, you know, the training, the mentoring, et cetera. And so this particular um, group of organizers, um, who work in the field were like, no, we're gonna start organizing the conference. It's gonna be in different cities on the continent hereafter. And what you see there, and it's so wonderful because it's mostly young people. So yes, there are a lot, but it's a, it's a new generation that's really getting into, into this field. And I'm happy to put the link somewhere so that people can just see it, providing a model of, of this, taking us out of the, the, the normal sort of centers of of power and science and seeing what happens. And it's very heartening to see the kind of work that's coming out of um, these particular um, exam these particular um, initiatives. Amazing. Um, I wanna talk about, um, I wanna read some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. One of them is from Janine. She asks, experiencing the fullness of our lives despite racial capitalist constraint is core to black culture. This is why Black cyber culture moves in relatively glorious freedom mm -hmm. within the constraints of tech platforms that are peak racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. How should how should we talk? How should we how should we talk and teach support to Black youth to ensure that they continue to be brilliantly engaged, but also engage consciously 
with corporate mm -hmm. social media platforms that exploit and instrumentalize us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And a second Don't, question. No, 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 no. I can only take one at a time. These are, <laughs> okay, I, I, I need already, to stop. I need to I change my life. Tell, <laughs> I can already tell. These are because it's just like there's layers to it. That that yeah. right there is a dissertation worthy question that I definitely don't have the answer to. So I'm just going to riff off, but I definitely can't hold that one in my brain and another one. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so yeah, what the, first of all, the question brings to mind is the amazing work of, um, you know, my colleague, Andre Brock and his recent book, Distributed Blackness, that gives many examples of what um, was just described here. And, and in fact, just today, I, um, I was on an Instagram live, listening to an Instagram live by the NAP Bishop, the NAP ministry. If, if you guys haven't heard of that, the NAP, N-A-P ministry, which is really, uh, you know, the, the core tenet is that rest is resistance and thinking about, um, you know, the, the productivity of, of capitalism and racial capitalism and, and grind culture. Um, how that really uh, works against our ability to be full human beings <laughs> in the question and be creative and critical and all of the things. And it's funny because she spent like the first 10 minutes of the live being like, y'all need to get off your devices. Y'all need to get off your devices. <laughs> but meanwhile, it's so it's interesting. She's telling us to get up, but at the same time, our ability to connect and engage, you know, with her, you know, with her sermon, which is basically a sermon on naps and rest was through this connectivity. Right? So there's this kind of duplicity where it's both the thing that connects us, but it also drains us and extracts from us. And, and real power is being able to control when and how you choose to connect, not feeling that you, to, to, to get basic things done in your life that you have to be connected and wired. And this really came to the four during the pandemic when especially elderly people, but also, you know, people who don't have internet at home in terms for school and for, and for even just registering for your vaccine, how if you're required to have this thing that is not even a public good, it's not even something that you're guaranteed, you have to have it, but it's privatized and you can't get basic things done in your life then there's something deeply, um, you know, there's a, a deep issue there where we make something required, but it's not, it's not accessible to everyone. And so, you know, going back to this question about, you know, especially thinking about the creativity that we pour into these, into these, uh, you know, platforms, um, I think as it stands, those who monopolize the platform, those who control the platform, as creative and wonderful and that that we are in the end you know i think it's hard to to provide guidance to say this is how you this is how you benefit from it um, um, and so i think it's a it's one of those questions that until we really transform the the ownership model and the economic model um, the the effects are going to be lopsided you know we will we will gain certain, you know, we will benefit in some ways, but ultimately who, who is um, benefiting the most are, are those behind the screen who control the terms, the, the, you know, the terms of service as it were. Um, so it's not a happy answer, but read Andre Brock, Distributed Blackness for uh, a more perhaps hopeful um, vision of this. Excellent. Um, the next question touches on actually part of your answer. Uh, Mary asks, it seems like educational tracking was an early form of technological discrimination. Do you see a connection there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I like, and I really like when people make those connections to what seem like kind of analog algorithms, <laughs> you know, and, and ways of distributing resources and opportunities like tracking. Um, because it reminds us again that although it's higher tech now, the math is more complicated perhaps, and it, it's more black boxed in terms of us being able to see what is actually going into the decisions that are being made. The underlying principles that tracking grows out of a eugenics philosophy uh, of humankind in terms of thinking about who has value, who has intelligence, 
giving them resources and opportunities and, and withholding those from others, I think not only do I see that as a kind of, uh, you know, a technology, tracking as a technology, but it's a eugenics technology. And so many of these um, these predictive tools um, and tracking, you know, we can think of it as a predictive technology. Like we're going to predict that you are, you have certain potential and you're going to get this, you know, this line of teachers and books and assignments and you go here. And so um, I think it's a, it's definitely a um, argument against tracking and there is a detracking movement underway that I've been reading about that's really getting to the root of the problem. It's not that we need more black kids in honors or AP. We need to question the entire <laughs> the entire system and <laughs> the entire, you know, uh, 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 some set of assumptions that goes into this particular way of distributing um, distributing power and organizing our educational system, a la detracking. Amazing. Um, another question is. Well, this is my own question. So this is about imagination because this is my favorite part of your talk, which is like recognizing that it is the scope of our imagination that is under, that is on the line, what we are capable of imagining. So, so I think social scientists have the job of like, um, so if fiction, cause I do both fiction and social science, right? So if fiction is about projecting and imagining and seeing something, completely out of thin air, I believe social scientists job is to make it possible in some mm. kind of way. So that's a very idealistic, I'm also in my first year, so I'm still bright eyed <laughs> and optimistic. I will but... tell you now, I will tell you now, I will tell you now that there are very few social scientists that see that as their mandate. Mm. And I actually wouldn't put much stock in social sciences or scientists mm doing that, I think we're much more, I would invest much more in grassroots movements and community workers who every day are world building, who are doing it, you know, and are translating the critiques and so on and the data and making the change tangible. And so, you know, I, I graduated 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, and just know, and my part of my own journey has been going from sociology to black studies. Mm -hmm. And in that shift, it's been exactly about imagination. Where can I think more freely, imagine more transformatively? And I think, I think that um, the social sciences aren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I want to hear more about what you what you see when you talk about imagination as a contested battleground mm -hmm. as the site in which we kind of figure out who gets to say what we will be who gets to say yeah. what this world will look like yeah. and I wanted you to talk a little bit because earlier you mentioned dystopia and utopias which is something that's really interesting to me in fiction um, mm -hmm. because I always look back at these old dystopian novels and I'm like y'all could they didn't they they had no idea like they, had, <laughs> uh, they wanted they talked about floating cars but like mm -hmm. we can talk to anyone in the world anytime and almost yeah. none of the books have that because it was so beyond the scope of our imagination we didn't even think wow. of, about that yeah and so I want to hear like if you were to write an episode of Black Mirror or yeah. Social Dilemma or whatever show, like a yeah. Afrofuturist show, what like yeah. any writer in the world, Issa Rae, whoever, you get everything, everyone, everybody, everything. Yeah. And yeah. you write, how would you write a story that tells us about, I realize it's a big question, mm -hmm. um, a story that tells us about the racial aspects of technology or mm -hmm. a story that really captures all the input output variables that mm -hmm. you think are crucial to this? Mm -hmm. Actually, I've written that story. <laughs> so thank you for asking. So first, so there's two things that I'll say. First, this idea of imagination. Um, uh, it, it really started percolating when I finished my first book, which was around biotechnologies. And I was sitting back and thinking like, what's this book about after I'd written it? Like, what's the heart of it? Why did I care so much about this? to study it for several years and do all this work. And it boiled down to uh, 
a recognition that there was there's a lopsided imagination <laughs> um, where many people, especially those who wield power and influence and resources, where they're very willing to invest in transforming our physical and our biological <laughs> uh, selves. But when it comes to society and social, our social, our body politic, their imagination goes limp. And so they will think of far out things that we can do technologically bio, you know, in terms of a biology. And for example, you know, growing heart cells in a laboratory so that we can grow human organs. So if you need a, a transplant, I don't need a donor. I can go and grow a heart using your cells so it'll match you so your body won't reject it. So at the same time that I'm sitting in meetings and walking around labs where this kind of work is happening, it's not future, it's happening. And, and it's, you know, on one level is very far fetched, but resources are being poured into it. So someone's imagination of what is possible is beginning to materialize because they were able to get the resources and the goodwill and et cetera to do it. And at the same time, in many of these contexts, I was often one of the few people in the social sciences or bioethics kind of raising my hand and be like, that's really cool what you guys are doing. Now, what about the fact that most people can't get their basic health taken care of? Like they can't, they're sick and they can't go to the hospital because of their insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And so when it came to current inequality, not fixing future illness, but current inequality, that was seen as far-fetched. Like we'll never be able to, you know, create create a healthcare system where everyone can, you know, get access to what they need. And that was cast as the thing that was too far-fetched and out of this world. That is creating a, a world in which everyone can get what they need <laughs> when they need it, right? Um, and so already you begin to see like this imagination is huge when it comes to biotechnology and AI, and we're going to have this and we're going to have that. And when it comes to just people being able to go and get basic sort of like, can we, can we have more, a more efficient DMV? <laughs> like, I don't know, I'm thinking big here, <laughs> right? And that's like, no, that, you know, that. And so the boil down to this question is why can we imagine growing heart cells in a laboratory and we can't imagine creating more empathy for other human beings in our everyday life? Like that is a lopsided imagination. And so finishing that book, a few years later, I actually had the opportunity to write some fiction, going to your second question. I was, um, it was 2015, we just, you know, we've just lived through the Ferguson uprisings. And there was a colleague of mine creating this, um, you know, this workshop on the history, the histories of the future. That's what she called it. And so it was about like, can we tell different histories of the future? And I was exhausted and didn't feel like writing an, another academic essay that we were asked to do for this workshop. And so I asked her, can I write a story instead? Like I can use that part of my brain and also be still process what's happening out in the world. Um, and because so much of academic writing feels like you kind of have to like close yourself off <laughs> rather than engaging fully. Right. And so that's what I did. I essentially wrote a short story that grew out of that research on biotechnology and this and people can people can check it out on um, you go to um my website ruhabenjamin.com the research tab it's under the the label racial fictions and essentially it imagines a band of black um scientists who are part of a reparations program that are growing organs and body parts for people who are victims of police brutality so using the regenerative medicine in a reparations model to basically address these harms that are our past. And so it imagines a world in which we've, we've um, abolished the police <laughs> um, and in which the science is being directed to, um, you know, addressing the, these ongoing traumas. And initially I was writing it more as a utopian story and something in me, just, it wasn't sitting right, like just making it a pure, like utopia, like, yay, we have control, we're growing what we you know? And so that, that part of me that was like, there's something else going on under the surface. It eventually changed what was happening. So on one level you have 
um, the main protagonist doing what they think of as like great social justice science. And then we learn towards the end of the story that in some ways that initiative is being manipulated by an unseen immortocracy, a group of elites that are basically allowing this group to hone these tools of, of re regeneration so that ultimately they can take it and use it. So it's like the, the, the individuals who are benefiting in the short run almost are, are, are the guinea pigs uh, for these tools to eventually be, be taken away. So, um, but the, the ending is more empowering. So you'll, I'll, I'll send you all to the story to, to, to read it. Um, but it answers your question in a very tangible way. How would I write it? What would I write? Um, and so I hope you all uh, check it out. Thank you so much. That was like the perfect, perfect um, ending point. And I'm not going to hand it off to Eve, but I just quickly want to say thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. This was such an honor to be able to speak with you. And awesome. it's like insane. <laughs> so, and thanks for taking my question seriously and giving such of amazing- course answers. Um, I'm going to pass it to Dr. E now. Thank you, Sianda. Oh my gosh, that was so fun to watch. I feel like just watching the, you know, when we talk about the kinds of technologies that we want to create, um, our relationships are also a form of technology, right? If we're using that, that definition of technology that you all gave us, which is what are the tools that are available to us as humans to build and imagine. And I feel like I got to witness um, the, this kind of interlocutor relationship between you as a technology being born before my very eyes. So thank you so much for such an incredible conversation. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. As always, thanks to our incredible team, Sianda Mohutsuwa, who not only was an incredible discussant this evening, but also holds us down every week on the tech side and the editing and the videos, as well as Imani Legrone, who's an amazing part of our team as well. And of course, our ASL interpreter, Barbara Williams Finley, and our friends and colleagues at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and the Mellon Foundation. Again, tomorrow evening, we have a new lecture dropping featuring Moya Bailey talking about Black Disability Studies. And we have a Q&A with Dr. Bailey one week from today, Thursday, June 17th at 6 p.m. Central Time. You don't have to remember any of that if you go to our website, blackfreedomlectures.org and sign up for our newsletter or follow us on all the socials. You can learn more about our terrific, inimitable guest, Ruha Benjamin at ruhabenjamin.com. That is R-U-H-A Benjamin.com. Com. You can also follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Ruha9. I'm Eve Ewing. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope everybody takes good care. <laughs>